The wait is over, and Jonathan Hickman's X-Men run is upon us. I'm Cody, and this is The Mutant Menace presents Deconstructing the House of X. Today on the show, we're taking a look at House of X issue 1, and we'll be doing things a little differently. I'd like to take time to dissect the issue and make some observations as to what it could be telling us about the future. So without further ado, let's dive right in. <laughs> House of X Issue 1 was written by Jonathan Hickman, with art by Pepe Larraz, colors by Marte Gracia, and letters by Clayton Cowles. Our issue begins with an ominous message from Professor X that reads, Humans of the planet Earth, while you slept, the world changed. From there, we see the Professor standing before a massive tree. It's important to note the Professor's Cerebra helmet obscures his face for the entirety of this issue, a classic fiction device telling us not to trust this character. On the tree are pod-like formations that begin to hatch revealing a number of humanoid figures, most notably as a red-headed female and a brown-haired man with beams of energy protruding from his eyes. Could these similarities to certain existing characters be mere coincidence? Personally, I doubt it. But if these are brand new characters, could the pods potentially be incubators for genetic samples growing into clones of mutants that we know? Others have postulated that these pods have some sort of rejuvenating or healing properties, perhaps even capable of resurrection, and that these are characters who have been dead and are returning. The truth will come to light in subsequent issues, I'm sure. But one thing is certain. Upon hatching, these mutants reach longingly for the professor as he smiles and simply says, to me, my X-Men. We are then shown images of familiar X-Men engaging with vibrant flowers in various locations. Colossus harvesting a flower on Krakoa, five months ago. Storm carrying a potted flower in Westchester, four months ago. Nightcrawler planting a flower on the blue area of the moon, three months ago. Armor planting one flower on Mars, two months ago. Beast observed a flower's growth in the Savage Land, one month ago. Kitty Pride and Lockheed beside growing flowers in Washington, D.C., three weeks ago. And the Stepford Cuckoos planting flowers in Jerusalem, two weeks ago. The next page takes us to present-day Jerusalem, where we see that the planted Krakoa flowers have blossomed into an enormous structure dubbed the Jerusalem Habitat. It is here that our story really kicks off, and I definitely think there's significance to that. It is said that Jerusalem is among the oldest cities in the world. It sits in the Middle East and is considered to be holy ground among three Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As such, it is the site of countless battles and struggles for power throughout history. In Judaism, it is the Temple Mount. In Islam, it is believed to be where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And in Christianity, it is where many Christians believe Jesus rose from the dead. What significance will it hold for mutants? It's also worth noting that a full-blown habitat was successfully grown from a Krakoan flower in just two weeks. That means that we can almost assume that the other flowers planted in this issue have already blossomed to full-blown habitats at this time. Today, the Jerusalem habitat is the meeting place of Magneto, the Cuckoos, and several nations' ambassadors responding to an invitation to discuss the professor's recent proposal to mankind, the gift of three super drugs derived from Krakoa flowers that grant different Different healing aspects. Human drug L extends human life by five years. Human drug I produces an adaptive, universal antibiotic. And human drug M cures diseases of the mind. What is the significance of these lettered designations? The implications of extending human life are interesting. Does it only tack on five more years to a natural life? Can it be used upon being diagnosed with a terminal illness to gain five more years? But if human drug I and M both exist to combat disease, why would that drug be necessary? The concept of an adaptive, universal antibiotic is topical in terms of real-life issues. In 2018, the World Health Organization reported that a growing resistance to antibiotic treatment is one of the largest threats to global health today, stating that a growing number of infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, and salmonellosis are becoming harder to treat as the antibiotics used to treat them become less effective. And finally, what are the implications of curing diseases of the mind? Is it not only referring to conditions such as dementia, but perhaps to disorders of all kinds. What are the limits of this cure? Needless to say, these drugs are gifts that humanity would have to be crazy to turn down. But of course, there's a catch. Mankind must recognize mutants as their own sovereign nation and leave them be. 
a prospect made all the more threatening to humans due to what their treasured cocoa grants to them. Gateways are flowers that grow pathways from where one is planted to its twin gateway on the mutant's island headquarters of Krakoa itself. Habitats are flowers that produce self-sustaining environments that can house and shelter mutants and are part of the interconnected consciousness of Krakoa. And finally, and most hauntingly, the no-place flowers. Non-naturally occurring flowers that produce habitats existing outside the collective consciousness of Krakoa. These are habitats that Krakoa itself is unaware of. It is chillingly referred to as a Krakoan tumor. Gateways and habitats are known concerns for the humans due in no small part to the militaristic implications of mutants being able to be virtually anywhere in the globe with alarming ease whenever they'd like to. But how many people are aware of this no place, if even Krakoa remains unaware of it? How many mutants know about the no place? What could be its uses? What are its dangers? For now, we see that mutants live in a peaceful bliss as Jean Grey welcomes youngsters to the lush environment of the island of Krakoa, the mutant headquarters in the Pacific Ocean just off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Cypher and the Krakoan consciousness monitor all comings and goings, communicating in a language only they speak, overseen by Sage. We learn that Krakoa is divided into 12 major sectors. The House of X, the House of M, Arbor Magna, the Arena, Academos Habitat, The Transit, The Oracle, The Grove, The Cradle, The Reservoir, The Wild Hunt, and The Carousel. In this utopia, mutants are kept safe and secure knowing that access is denied to any non-mutant personnel who are only permitted entry while accompanying a mutant and with full permission from Krokoa itself. But like any utopia, a sinister undertone seems to loom somewhere beneath the surface, and forces opposed to its growth begin to stir outside its borders. The Orcus Protocol is a doomsday scenario set to respond to certain developments in mutant activity at large based on three major factors, population, financial developments, and territorial matters. The program was a direct response to the research of one Dr. Alia Gregor, who postulated that after the tragedy on Genosha, mutants would be unable to repopulate to the extent of becoming Earth's dominant species. Her work would prove the contrary. Mutants were reappearing at a rapid rate, and if Genosha had never happened, mutants would have replaced humans as the dominant species within 10 years. With recent developments taken into account, her number has become 20 years. The Orcus Protocols have been triggered. Within two short years, events have occurred that directly correlate with the factors the program was designed to monitor. One year ago, a massive increase in X-Gene activation was reported. Population. Six months ago, companies owned by Charles Xavier acquired the world's seventh largest pharmaceutical company and will be potentially distributing new drugs that will destabilize the market upon being spread throughout global financial sectors. And two months ago, which would line up with when the Krakoa flowers were planted on Mars, the mutant nation of Krakoa was established. But what exactly are the protocols? A massive space station called the Forge has been constructed as mankind's last bastion for survival. As we join Dr. Gregor aboard the Forge, as well as Omega Sentinel, we see that it appears to be simulating an atmosphere very similar to Earth, with oxygen and edible vegetation being grown within its walls. We learn that upon being completely constructed, the machines and artificial intelligence that built and maintained the structure were repurposed to go mining for resources. All of this activity lends itself to our understanding that a plan for eventual evacuation of the Earth has been prepared totally undetected by mutants. But will humans simply just leave? The presence of what looks like a giant sentinel head referred to as mother mold in system files would certainly suggest something far more grim. So just who are Orcus, and why are they operating on such a huge scale? Orcus as an entity is actually made up of some very familiar organizations. It is 31% AIM, 24% SHIELD, 16% STRIKE, 8% SWORD, 7% ALPHA FLIGHT, 5% HAMMER, 5% ARMOR, and 4% HYDRA. The fact that so many powerhouse institutions of the Marvel Universe are working together on this is pretty telling of the human need for survival against the other. The Orcus command structure breaks down into a director from Strike, a head engineer from Alpha Flight, military command from S.H.I.E.L.D., and Dr. Alia Gregor themselves as Science Command, 
with Karima Shapandar aka Omega Sentinel as the machine's liaison. Despite being the combined project of various entities, Orcus stands out as a name in that it does not appear to be an abbreviation for anything. So what does Orcus mean? An Orcus is defined as an orchid of, or formerly of, a genus native to north temperate regions, characterized by a tuberous root and an erect, fleshy stem bearing a spike of typically purple or pinkish flowers. And where have we seen purple or pinkish flowers before? Just as flowers appear to be a source of power for mutants in this story, flower imagery is being used as a symbol to represent the efforts of what Orcus Captain Erasmus refers to as a Hail Mary for humanity. This can't be a coincidence, and already Hickman is playing with ideas of organic versus inorganic states of being, with the recurring use of plant life and machines, fabricated or synthesized drugs from natural sources. Now, when I think organic versus inorganic and the synthesis of the two in terms of the X-Men, my mind goes to Warlock and Doug Ramsey. We saw in this issue that Cypher has a techno-organic limb and shares a unique bond with Krakoa in that they speak a language only they understand, a harmonious bond between organic and inorganic. I have a feeling Cypher will play out an important role in this story, so he'll be one to watch. Let us now return to Earth, where Mystique, Toad, and Sabretooth, members of a group we've long recognized as the Brotherhood, have broken into a storage facility housing incredibly advanced technology that once belonged to superpowered beings who have now been designated as dead, incapacitated, or missing. As such, these devices exist in a sort of limbo, with no particular person or corporate entity holding true ownership over their use. The facility in which this technology is held is called Contested Storage, and it is maintained by a corporation known as Damage Control, which traditionally serves a repair and rebuild purpose, cleaning up after superpowered events. It appears they have broken in to steal information, as Toad is seen to be copying over the combined databases of Tony Stark and Reed Richards before the Fantastic Four show up to stop them. All but Sabretooth escape, who Sue Storm imprisons in a force field as Cyclops shows up to request that he be set free and sent back through a gateway with him. It is here we see that broad amnesty is being requested for mutants, even in light of breaking, entering, and injuring numerous guards. Struggling to understand why the X-Men are acting this way, Sue questions Cyclops, who simply explains that they are done being hated and hunted, and it is time to become more. Cyclops makes a remark suggesting Franklin Richards should join them on Krakoa, a final middle finger before disappearing through a gateway. Back in Jerusalem, we learn that Xavier's intentions are very much to build a mutant culture, complete with its own language. Through the cuckoo's psychic prying, we also learn that the ambassadors invited to the Jerusalem habitat are not what they seem, but are actually planted agents from various organizations to gather intel on the mutant goings-on. One of the agents is able to successfully hide his affiliation, and my money is on this guy being straight from Orcus, who have somehow been able to keep mutants oblivious to their activities. Unsurprised by this development, Magneto simply admonishes that everything is about to change for the humans, and it's in their best interest to accept what Xavier is offering and be grateful. The issue ends with the unbelievably badass and ominous line of, You have new gods now. The final pages are written in Krakoan and read, Next, it's not a dream if it's real. And then, the curious case of Moira X. So what did you think of House of X issue 1? This is already a wonderfully dense story with loads to talk about, and there is obviously a ton I've left out. I'd love your take on some information that we've been given thus far, and remember to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more content. Thank you so much for watching, and say it with me, we are the Mutant Menace. Hey, hey, hey.